Welcome to the Age is Irrelevant podcast with your host, Helen Fridge. Helen is a 60 plus lifelong competitive athlete, flight attendant, published fitness model, writer, IFBB bodybuilding pro, and certified wine specialist who believes that your age is irrelevant to pursue goals, dreams, and desires. Are you a woman in her 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond who still has a burning desire to pursue a dream or a passion? Are you thinking about starting a new chapter in your life, but you're hesitant, thinking that you might be too old or just don't know where to begin? The Age is Irrelevant podcast is a podcast devoted to women who want to defy the odds, smash barriers, and redefine happiness and success after 40. It's time to make a difference. There is no need to dread blowing out that added birthday candle every year. A new movement is slowly taking momentum, where being over the hill just isn't relevant anymore. Age labels are being thrown out the window, and women are rediscovering the strength within themselves to make a difference, not only within their own lives, but also touching and inspiring the lives of other women. Join Helen as she and her guests discuss all aspects of aging after 40 and how to make the aging process and those twilight years more rewarding, exciting, and fun. Hello, and welcome to the Age is Irrelevant podcast. I'm your host, Helen Fritch, and this is episode number 97. Well, get your pens and your pads ready because today I have a great guest, full of great information concerning longevity. I am talking to 55-year-old Dr. Sandra Kaufman. Uh, Presently, she is the National Transitional Pediatric Anesthesia Medical Director for Envision Healthcare, but I'm talking to her today because she is also a longevity expert. She is the best-selling author of two books and the creator of the Kaufman Protocol, which is a systematic explanation of why we age on a cellular basis, coupled with an organized system to delay the aging process. We talk about longevity protocols starting at the age of 40, different hacks that you can do to enhance your aging process, different lifestyle protocols that we can do to slow down our aging process and supplementation that we can take to help us along again with the aging process. A very informative conversation. She is delightful, so knowledgeable. I'm very anxious to go through this book. I've already bought one of her books and I'm sure I'll be getting the other one when I'm finished with this because when it comes to our longevity when it comes to skincare over the age of 40, 50, 60, and beyond. I'm all for it. I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I enjoyed interviewing her. And here we go. Hi, Dr. Kaufman. Welcome to the show. Hi, happy to be here. I am thrilled that you are here. I actually heard you on a podcast probably a couple of months ago and This major light bulb was going off on my head thinking, oh my God, she'd be so amazing to have on my show because many of my listeners are over 50 and they will resonate with all of your knowledge and all of your expertise and what you have to offer. So I'm super psyched. So for my listeners, I am uh, speaking with Dr. Sandra Kaufman. Now, Dr. Kaufman began her academic career in the field of cellular biology, earning a master's degree from the University of Connecticut in tropical ecology and plant physiology. Then turning to medicine, she received her medical degree at the University of Maryland and completed a residency and fellowship at Johns Hopkins University, and presently is the National Transitional Pediatric Anesthesia Medical Director for Envision Health. Also in the realm of longevity, which we're mainly going to be talking about today, she is the author and creator of the Kaufman Protocol, which is a a systematic explanation of why we age on a cellular basis coupled with an organized system to delay the aging process. She has authored two books, The Kaufman Protocol, Why We Age and How to Stop It, and recently, The Kaufman Protocol, Aging Solutions with an Updated and Expanded Dive into Longevity Science. 
She is well respected in the longevity community for presenting viable and scientifically based aging solutions that are available to everyone. She appears on weekly podcasts around the world. She sits on longevity boards and has spoken to innumerable health and biohacking seminars. I am so psyched to have you. (laughs) Pleased to be here. (laughs) So I always like to start off with my guests, just hearing your background about where you were born, where you grew up, and kind of we'll just transition into where you are today. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. I was born in Maryland, a very small town called Frederick sits outside of D.C. Uh, nothing horribly spectacular. I was a bit of everything, I guess. Bit of an athlete, bit of a science geek. Um, not, nothing too exciting. My mother, however, when I was younger, was very sick and ended up becoming the very first victim of toxic shock syndrome. Oh, wow. And I think that that drove me away from medicine at first, but then also sort of piqued my curiosity. So inevitably, I sort of ended up in the medicine world. But uh, I was always a science geek. Um, I'm, I'm sure most of your your guests probably say the same thing. <laughs> I remember doing science projects in school, and I'm, I'm not a big science geek, and science was not one of my favorite subjects. But when I would be able to like add one, one together in the project and then come out with the result that I was looking for. I was like so excited that it actually worked. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's my um, spiel on, on science. So um, you went to school, you got your degrees and then um, are you in pediatrics? Is that what you specialized in? Yeah. So I'm a pediatric anesthesiologist at the moment. I have been one for, oh gosh, 22 years. Um, the funny thing is, of course, it's my main gig, but it's transitioning into being a side gig, which is kind of funny, um, because I, I, being an amateur athlete, I'm kind of, I'm just addicted to rock climbing and outside sports. And I love the idea of hanging off of cliffs and torturing my body and doing ridiculous things. And, you know, I, I can entertain you with all the dumbass things I've done outside. Um, but it dawned on me like in my early mid forties that unless I solved, uh, aging, my, my days of doing my crazy things were going to come to a crashing end. Um, so I decided to figure it out, right? And it's, and it's an absolutely ridiculous quest at some point to sit down and say, oh, I'm going to figure out why we age. But uh, I spent zillions of hours reading zillions of articles uh, in the cellular biology world because that's sort of what I knew. That's where I came from. Um, and I narrowed it down to what I consider the seven tenets of aging. And, of course, they all have subcategories. Um, and then I just started doing things one thing at a time after time after time. And then I tried to organize it. So that sort of turned into what I call the Kaufman rating system. And that became, became numerical algorithms to help me and then all of my friends not age, which then led to a million questions like, what the hell are you doing to yourself? Because we're getting older and you're not. Which <laughs> led to, gosh, I guess I should write a book, which led to podcasts, which then led to another book. Uh, and now here we are, you know, years later, um, and I do podcasts all the time, and I write books, and I travel the world, and I'm opening up a longevity clinic in March, and hopefully transitioning out of anesthesia. Oh, that's so, fantastic. That's where we are. And are you still in Maryland now? No, no, no. I, I left Maryland a long time ago. Uh, I lived there as a kid, obviously. I went to college, actually, I, due to the seriousness of my uh, mom and all that kind of stuff. My dad kicked me out of the state so I, I wouldn't be a mom caretaker. Uh, and I ran down here to University of Miami uh, and actually got a tan, which retrospectively was a really bad idea in terms of longevity. Um, but spent four years in Miami, and then I decided to go to University of Connecticut for grad school. Uh, decided that cells don't pay bills. So then I went to med school. I went back to Maryland because of in-state tuition, which was quite nice. I was going to be a general surgeon, so I did a year of Baylor, but I really wanted to be a brain surgeon. So I did that for a year uh, down here at University of Miami, uh, and then decided it was horribly depressing, and the outcomes were terrible. And the anesthesia department said, well, why don't you come out and hang out with us? So I did that for a year in Miami, but then I thought, you know, if I'm going to do anesthesia, I really want to go to the top place. So I transferred to Hopkins, uh, back to Baltimore. So I stayed there for another bunch of years and then finished as a fellowship uh, doing pediatrics. So I think I've sort of gone up and down the East Coast quite a bit, uh, landing in Miami, and now I've been here permanently for about 20 years. Oh, that's great. Yeah, my, I love Miami, especially this time of year. I'm actually in Phoenix right now, so um, it's 80 and sunny outside. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> oh, I, I was in Phoenix last week. It was gorgeous. 
Oh, you were? That's awesome. Yeah, I, I live here. I'm a flight attendant. I'm based in Charlotte. Uh, I work for American. So um, I'm going back and forth. As a matter of fact, I go back to work tomorrow. But um, yeah, I'm just I moved here about three years ago from Charlotte. And I'm just happy as a clam. I'm just beside myself. I'm so happy here. <laughs> it's I, I don't blame you. It's beautiful. I was enthralled with Phoenix. It was gorgeous. But anyway, so um, so now you're out of school and you're hanging out in the NSC anesthesiology department and what all how all of a sudden you were talking about you know um cells don't pay the bills but you obviously kind of transgressed back to cells uh because of the longevity that you're in now so how did that happen you know so i was i you know i spent the first bunch of years just sort of being a regular (laughs) anesthesiologist and then you know after a while you know he who stands there the longest becomes chief sort of thing so I just had a lot of time in my office late at night, taking call, et cetera, et cetera. So I had a lot of access to library stuff, right? Like medical library stuff that you don't normally get a chance to do. Um, I spent an inordinate amount of time sitting in that damn office. Um, and at the same time, as I said, I was a rock climber and watching my body sort of just take a beating. And so I thought, you know what? I wonder why you age. Just sort of this random question popped into my head one night sitting there and just started Googling it. You know, and 10 years ago, there was nothing in any popular literature about what to do. You know, sort of, you know, do yoga and eat yogurt. Um, And I thought, that's not the answer. So I started doing this deep dive into why you age. And I realized, you know, your, your, your kidney doesn't age. The cells in your kidney ages. And all cells roughly age for the same reasons. Uh, granted, you know, they're not exactly the same in terms of like ratios of importance, but all cells basically age in the same way. And I thought, I'm going to figure this out. So you just go deeper and deeper and deeper into every little possible molecular mechanism of a cell. And some of it's completely stagnant with time and some of it takes a dive. And the cool thing um, is that they're depending on how deeply you want to get into this, you can absolutely decelerate the aging process. Um, I mean, there's many ways to to measure it, and that's a whole other topic. Um, you know, people always say, you know, my test demonstrates that I'm X number of years old and blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. Um, but depending on what you measure and how you measure it, you're obviously can come up with a million different answers. But in just in terms of how I actually feel, uh, I'm 55 and I feel like I'm 30. Like, nothing hurts. I don't need reading glasses. Like, I have more energy in the world. Last week, I was hiking frozen volcanoes in Ecuador. I do crazy stuff and I still can. And I think it's really, really amazing. So I am absolutely convinced that the cellular processes can be decelerated and anyone can do it. It's, this is not rocket science. Well, and I love hearing that. And I'm a podcast junkie. Not only do I you know, host a podcast, but I'm listening to podcasts all day long. And, you know, some of my favorite fitness podcasts are like, or excuse me, bio or biohackers and just learning about, you know, zombie cells and, how, you know, I think a normal lay person doesn't think about cellular as far as looking into the mirror and seeing your skin. Um, You know, a lot of it, I'm a a master's bodybuilding athlete. And, you know, so eating clean is really important to me. But, you know, your skin is a big reflection of what you eat. So I think my skin looks, you know, I do take care of my skin. But on a deeper cellular level, I'm learning a ton about, you know, zombie cells and senolytics and all this other fun stuff and all these other, you know, supplements and biohacks that you can do or take that really do make a huge difference. And I think with my listeners, especially a lot of of these women are over the age of 50, they'll look into the mirror one day and they're developing jowls and they're developing wrinkles and their skin is, you know, concave, their, 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 their facial skin. So, um, I just think that you're like the perfect guest to have on here to explain exactly scientifically what's going on, but at the same time, offer suggestions that can help us, you know, decrease the acceleration of, you know, of the aging process. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. And, I, and, and I'm happy to uh, tell you anything you want to know. Um, All right. So I do have a bunch of questions for you. Okay. So, bring it on. Um, let's just start off with... Um, What do you think, just starting off, uh, some of the common habits or lifestyle factors that lead to a longer life? I want to go general, and then we'll get more specific. Sure, 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 sure. So I think that anything that your mother told you was good for you or your grandmother, you know, a million years ago, it's probably true. 
uh, because it usually translates to sort of epigenetic modification. So for example, when you say eating clean, you're epigenetically modifying your DNA and your proteins. And, and, and that sounds like a weird statement, but it's absolutely true. Uh, one of my favorite examples has to do with uh, bees, right? If you look at a hive, there's the queen bee, and then there are all of the like the little worker bees. When all of those bees, including the queen, were larvae, they were all fed exactly the same thing, right? At some point, the larvae that's, deter- that, that's predestined to be the queen starts getting fed royal jelly instead of all the regular other stuff that these bees are eating. And the change in the diet dictates a change in that person, person the, that bee's future, right? So the queen bee, just by eating a different diet, is three times as large, and her entire life trajectory is significantly different, right? And if you take that and you generalize it to what we are, your food choices will absolutely dictate your future. You can tell people that eat Twinkies every day, and you can tell the people that eat a salad every day. And it's not just your weight, but it's the nutrients going in and out of your different cells. Um, And a lot of people, by the time they're in their mid-50s, are micronutrient deficient because whatever food choices they make are sort of ruled out other stuff. Um, So here's an easy biohack. I tell everyone, men, women, old, young, everyone needs a prenatal vitamin because you absolutely, by by definition, by the time you're 40-ish, you're micronutrient deficient. Um, And you should treat your cells in your body like you would, you know, like you're growing a fetus. You don't need an entire dose. Uh, but you need some. Um, and that usually makes people do incredibly well. And a lot of women out there um, will have experienced this. When they are pregnant, they take a prenatal, their hair is better, their skin is better, their nails grow. Then as soon as the baby's born, they stop doing it. And then they go back to the, what they were ever doing before. So mm-hmm. my argument is always, well, why not treat yourself as you treated your baby and and do it? So there's hack number one in terms of just good dietary habits. That's awesome. That's a great hack. Um, Can you explain to my listeners um, what epigenetics means? So absolutely. Uh, And I kind of threw that out, and I apologize if that's... No, no, uh, I know what it is, but I know there's probably a lot of people out there who don't. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, So when we think about our DNA, uh, Watson and Creek described this in 1957. It looks like a ladder that's twisted. It's called a spiral double helix. But if you think a ladder and it's twisted, um, that's what we all thought DNA was, and, and that was it. And now what we know is that several things happen. So number one, um, little methyl groups, and in my book I draw them like lollipops, um, attach themselves to the side of the ladder, and that's called methylation. Just a little methyl groups, a little carbon with some hydrogens on there, and it sticks on, and that is methylation. And by doing that, it changes which piece of DNA can get used and translated into a protein. So it controls what messages your cell can use and not use. And over time, that pattern of methylation changes. Um, So epi means on top of. So that methylation is a piece of epigenetic modification of your DNA. Um, On top of that, it turns out that your DNA is packaged Uh, in such a way that it's more organized. It's not just like a bowl of spaghetti. It's actually pretty well organized. And it's compressed by wrapping around these complexes of of proteins called histones. And we always draw them like a four by two matrix, um, which kind of is real and kind of isn't. But the DNA wraps around it, uh, losing about 157 base pairs. And so if you were to draw it, it would look like Christmas lights. So there's a strand, it wraps around, strand, wraps around. Uh, And those histones get things glued on them. Just like the methyl group is on your DNA, things get glued onto your histones. And it either encourages or blocks the usage of that little section of DNA. Um, And it can be, uh, let's see, it can be methyl groups, it can be acetyl groups, it can be phosphorylation groups, but all sorts of things basically serve as roadblocks to control your DNA. And by changing your diet, you're changing those patterns, which means you're changing the expression of the DNA and thus the proteins that you can theoretically make. Um, And epigenetic modification by lifestyle uh, pretty much explains why two identical twins look less and less and less alike as they get older. Because theoretically, their baseline DNA is the same, but their environments are different, so their epigenetic changes uh, change how their, 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 their world is expressed over time. So hopefully that's an understandable explanation of epigenetics. No, no, that's a great explanation. Thank you so much. Um, Can you discuss some of the latest research on aging and longevity? 
Oh my God. That's like asking me to count the stars in the sky. Um, <laughs> you guys. Well, the ones that you like, or, you know, maybe some of your top picks. Oh gosh. You know what? Here, here, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to run through what I consider the seven tenets quickly. Oh, okay. Because Perfect. Each tenant gives you a, a glance into what you, what sort of goes wrong. Um, and it sort of helps people put all of this into some sort of matrix to understand. Um, so tenant one has to do with changes to your DNA. Uh, and we talked about epigenetics, so that's huge. A second thing in the category has to do with telomere length. Uh, telomeres are the ends of your chromosomes, and as you get older and as your cells multiply and as you get uh, oxidative stress and glycation stress, they get shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, and people measure this. You can measure your DNA age via telomere length, and essentially it correlates to length of your expected life. So the shorter they get, the worse off you are. Um, and there are some things that you can do to maintain your telomeres. There's a whole lot of supplements and such that you can take. So that's important. Um, and then same thing in this category. I always talk about um, structure of DNA. So in the nucleus, there's some that's bunched together and then some that's more spaghetti-like. It's a, it's a ratio of heterochromatin to euchromatin. That changes with the age, and you can sort of control that as well. Um, but that's like the three big things basically in tenant one that have to do with your DNA. Um, tenant two is mitochondrial failure. Um, if anyone remembers back to the fifth grade, uh, looking at the cell, mitochondria is where the energy comes from. Um, they look like the little, um, beans with little zigzaggy sort of lines in the middle. Um, if you don't have mitochondria or your mitochondria start to fail over the course of time, you don't have energy. And I have come to realize that the most or the biggest complaint that anyone over 50 has is lack of energy. So if you can maximize your mitochondria, you're going to do just so much better. And it turns out that your mitochondrial fail. Um, I like to think of it in seven different subcategories, but that's probably too much minutia for most people. But the easiest thing that you can do in terms of mitochondrial health uh, over the age of 40 is um, sort of repleting something called NAD. It's nicotine adenine dinucleotide, and your body needs it for many reasons. Um, but the big one is for mitochondrial use, and we know that as you get older, you become deficient. Um, most people in the, in, in the business know this, so there's a uh, there's a war between all of these different companies to determine who can make the best NAD precursor. So in terms of oral supplementation, you're looking at nicotinamide riboside versus nicotinamide mononucleotide. Um, but there's also nasal sprays, there's patches, there's IVs, there's IM, because we know that it's helpful. It's just a matter of like which way you, you know, people want to go. Um, so that that's also like an easy, low hanging fruit for anyone on the longevity bandwagon. Them. Let me ask a question about NAD. <clears throat> um, so would it be, I don't want to use the word beneficial, but if people have a specific disease or people have cancer, would that encourage the cancer cells to grow or is that like a fine line? No, 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 no. So you're absolutely right. So the, my entire program optimizes cells. Um, and there's no way that I can't optimize a normal cell without guaranteeing that I'm not going to optimize a cancer cell. So you absolutely, before you start a longevity protocol, must rule out obvious cancers. Um, I do this via Grail test, which is a blood test, and it looks at, uh, I don't know, 40-some different cancers. And it doesn't tell you 100%, but it gives you a pretty damn good idea if you have cancer or not. Um, and then full body scans. Um, so before I will treat anyone, um, you know, in clinic or by, uh, you know, teleconferencing, we make sure that they do not have cancer because you're spot on. You do not want to encourage your cancer cells. Okay. That's really good to know. Um, I have leukemia, <laughs> so I've had it for 10 years. Luckily, no, um, um, no treatments yet. So all is good. Um, but you know, uh, the NAD is very, very, you know, was very, very interesting to me. And then I, you know, kind of did the math and thought, I, I, that's probably not a good idea to be taking that when I could, could encourage, you know, cancer cell growth when I'm already concerned about that to begin with. So that's great. Thank you for clearing that up. It's really good. Yeah. Gee, I am, I, I am so sorry. That's, that's horrible. Oh, well, I mean, it, 
you know, it, it is what it is. I was dealt that hand, but um, I don't really, you know, dwell on it. It's it's there. Um, I feel great. I, I wouldn't have never known that I've had it unless I, you know, I went in for an annual exam, and got a blood test that came back bad. And I was mad because I thought it was wrong. <laughs> so anyway, it's all it's all it's all good so far. Um, so genetics, obviously, in my opinion, and I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm asking you this, this question, too. Um does it play a big role determining how long someone may live? That's an excellent question. Um, We used to think that it had a huge amount to deal with it. Um, Some research say it's down to less than 9% influencing what you're going to do. Some people think that it's up to 30%. It's really hard to say. Um, you know, because everyone says, oh, my grandmother lived to 105, I'm going to be fine. And the answer is that may or may not be true statistically, right? They lived in a different world than we live in. So it's really, it's, I wouldn't count, I wouldn't bank on grandma's old age helping you out. Right, right. <laughs> that, and that's true. Um, what are some important things that people can do to maintain good health as they age? Well, number one, you should be on a longevity protocol. Starting at the age of 40, you need to start doing stuff. Um, because, you know, we got we got to mitochondria, but there's seven tenants. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's, Let's go ahead. So there's a whole bunch of other things. So, like, epigenetics, changing your diet is important in one. Two, NAD is important, and a whole lot of variety of other things. Three is pathways. And this one's crucial because... Uh, there's something called the sirtuin pathways. There's seven mammalian sirtuins, and not that this is all that important, but they're histone deacetylases. And they basically turn enzymes usually on and off, right? And they control all cellular homeostasis. And by the time you are in your 40s, statistically, your sirtuins take a dive. So if you don't do anything to help that, you're, you're just going to not function very well by default. Uh, For example, sirtuin one, it controls your cholesterol levels and controls your circadian rhythms. It controls the the bacteria in your gut. It controls oxidative status. It controls pretty much everything. Um, And if your sirtuins are low, you're you're just not going to do very well. So again, easy thing to do. The best sirtuin one activator is either pterostilbene or resveratrol. Simple stuff. The caveat, however, to that is you need NAD as a cofactor to make sirtuins work. So by the time you're 40, you're short of sirtuins, you're short of NAD, therefore (laughs) your cellular homeostasis is going to take a dive. Um, So that's kind of important. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's pathways. Let's see. Uh, Four is what I call quality control. This is uh, DNA repair mechanisms, uh, protein proteostasis and repair mechanisms, and then autophagy, which is very important. That's a, that's a huge thing that people talk about now is recycling of pieces and parts of your cell that are no good. Yeah, let's um, talk about autophagy because a lot of people don't know what that is, but I, I think that's huge. No, it, it it absolutely is huge. And the idea here of autophagy is simply recycling. It's like taking out your recycling, you send it away, you, you know, you fix what you can and you reuse it. And then you have a little bit left that you can't reuse and it sort of ends up in the corner. So what your cells do is as your organelles are not functioning uh, the way they should, is that piece gets sort of hacked off, put in a little vesicle with some special enzymes, and you break down the pieces and parts so that you can reuse them. It's a great recycling program. Um, and then the pieces that you can't break down get mushed in the back of your cell. They accumulate, and that's called lipofusion. Um so you don't want to necessarily force your cells in a bad state where they have to undergo autophagy a lot, because then you get a huge accumulation of lipofusion. So in cells that do not divide and you can't get rid of the lipofusion, you're sort of in trouble. So brain cells, for example, by the time you die, if you're like 100 and some, you're, you're, you're full of lipofusion. It's kind of gross. Um, but in general, you want decent amounts of autophagy, uh, just not an overwhelming amount of autophagy, but it's really hard to actually do that. Um, so in this category, one of the best things that stimulates autophagy is something called spermidine. Um, It's a polyamine. We have it in our bodies all the time. We tend to be more deficient as we get older. It's you buy it over the counter. And I got to tell you, it makes everything better. It's just incredible. 
Um, as far as autophagy also too, um, isn't there a lot of correlation between that and um, intermittent fasting or th- fasting in general? Right. So, so, so this is really, your body is so smart. I just, I think the human body is just an unbelievably smart thing to do. So if you think of your body um, in, in terms of like a finance division, right? Um, if, so you've got your cell and let's say you're intermittent fasting. So your energy levels are low right? Your energy, like, like, what are you going to do? So your body says, well, huh, I don't have a whole lot of energy to spend here. I'm not going to go buy new pieces and parts because I'm broke. I'm going to use the ones that I already have and I'm going to recycle them. Right? So Mm -hmm. it does that. So caloric restriction encourages autophagy. On the other hand, if you are not caloric restricted, if you are like, you know, eating a billion pounds of chocolate, your body's going to say, I have got so much energy to spend. I'm just going to make new parts and like, forget about the old ones. And then your body just fills up with like crap. Um, so it's a very brilliant thing to do. Um, so you can actually, so you can, a, you can go use caloric restriction techniques, or I use caloric restriction memetics, which actually tell my body that I'm starving and it precipitates all of the changes without actually having to starve because I get really bitchy and grumpy when I'm hungry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so what's the uh, next um, category? Let's see. So five is your immune system that fails over time and it becomes your inflamed system. Um, so leads to leukemias and lymphomas, unfortunately. Uh, it leads to like, people not responding to vaccines very well. It leads to uh, diseases that are sort of quiescent to sort of explode in your body, which is why people get shingles and stuff as they get older. Um, but more importantly, you become systemically inflamed over time. Um, if you look, you can always, I mean, people just look red, they look swollen. Uh, this is just systemic inflammation. Everyone has it. Um, it comes from fat tissue. A lot of it does anyway. So uh, if you are overweight, that's a big problem. It comes from failure of the cells that are supposed to protect you. Uh, there's probably three or four, maybe even more good reasons why you are inflamed over the course of time. So part of uh, tenant five is to sort of take a lot of anti-inflammatories from different aspects or to trigger your body to be able to make anti or anti-inflammatories. That's that's great to know. Uh, let's see six is what I call individual cell needs. And this is where we have your senescent cells. Um, And you're right, people call them zombie cells. I like to think of them as grumpy old men cells. Um, And here's my rationale, and you can either agree or disagree. Um, When a cell becomes senescent, it becomes fat. Um, The morphology changes, it becomes lumpy and bumpy and chunky. And the organelles become bloated on the inside and they don't really do what they're supposed to do. And the cell emits something called an SASP, uh, which is just sort of angry cytokines and inflammatory factors. So I picture the old fat guy in the corner at work. He's just sort of, you know, one time he was thin and happy and now he's just old and grumpy kind of dysmorphic, you know, you've got the jowls and he just spews out really obnoxious inflammatory statements. And that is a senescent cell. Um, And there's a lot of, I mean, not a lot, but there are supplements out there now that um, you can apparently take to help get rid of these senescent cells. Is that correct? So so the answer is sort of. Um, The big ones in the study right now are quercetin, which is over the counter, uh, comes from... Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a natural agent. Uh, but the problem is, is it's, it's paired with a chemotherapy agent, um, Desinitib, um, which is usually given to people with CML. Um, they, they take it chronically. We would take it uh, two to three days out of every couple months paired with quercetin. Uh, that seems to, you know, be helpful. It's not the end all be all. Fisetin, which comes from strawberries, is also helpful. Uh, but you have to take a lot of it. So I just kind of take mega doses uh, once a month. Um, and then there are some antibiotics that do it as well. And I take something goofy called roxythromycin. And so I sort of rotate this series of senolytics because not all senescent cells are the same. They sort of carry features of the cell from which they came. And so you've got zillions of types of cells. So it's going to make sense that you have significant numbers of different types of senescent cells. So different therapies will sort of get rid of those. 
Um, and I will tell you that as you get older and as you have more pathology, you're going to have more senescent cells. So you kind of want to be careful if you go aggressively getting rid of all of your cells because, you know, a good friend of mine and I kid around that, like, if you give senes anti-senescent stuff to a 90-year-old, they're just going to turn into a pile of dust, um, right? Because there's no healthy cells left. Right. Uh, so this is something that you sort of want to combat early in, in life, maybe not 30s, but definitely 40, 45, 50, and then sort of continue the process of clearing out your cells as you get older. Great advice. Great advice. Okay, number six. Uh, so that actually, so six were in individual cell needs. It's senescent cells and oh. stem cells, right? Stem cells are the opposite of senescent cells. We want to keep absolutely fantastically good care of our stem cells. Um, and then the, and then there's also the idea that a liver cell needs something than a bone cell versus a brain cell. So that that category sort of just caters to the individual needs. Um, and then our last category is uh, what I call waste management. And this is mostly glycation. Um, glucose and different sugars that are reducing cause absolute havoc around the body over time. Um, not only is sugar inflammatory, but sugar combines non-enzymatically with proteins and lipids and some DNA, and it causes something called AGEs, advanced glycation end products. These things are horribly inflammatory. They also destroy the protein to which it is stuck. Um, and they also destroy, they like to land on collagen and, and a variety of other long-lasting tissues, and it destroys it. So AGEs and, gly and glucose issues is the, one of the prime reasons that your face sort of drops as you get older, because you're losing the structure of the collagen. Um, mm -hmm. It also is what makes bones very frail over time. Um, so all of these permanent collagen-based tissues get glycated, and they just fall to pieces. Mm -hmm. um, so huge problem. So I'm I'm sort of a, you know, do as I say, not as I do kind of person because I am a junk food junkie. Uh, I love sugar. On the other hand, I take literally 70 different agents a day, including like three for diabetes, of which I don't have diabetes, but I try to make sure that my glucose load is as minimal as possible. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's awesome. Um, are there any particular diets that you think are associated with the longer lifespans? Healthy ones. Um so the answer is yes, but no. I think that any diet that is crazy in any one direction or another at some point is going to be limiting. You know, people love the keto diet. On the other hand, having all of that fat in your system is not great. So I have a normal healthy diet, but I love keto. So I just take um, keto pills so I get the benefit of, of, of the, the, the butyrates and all that sort of thing without actually having to eat the fat because it's kind of gross. People that are just vegetarians, um, tend, they're, then they're deficient in things that come from, from meats. For example, carnosine is a dipeptide. It comes from meats. It's extremely important. It's a transglycosylating agent, and you, you can't get it if you're a vegetarian. Right. Um, on the other hand, I think every diet has pros and cons. So my advice would be as healthy as possible, um, staying, you know, like a modicum of everything is, is, is appropriate. Right, right. Um, do you think there's any particular lifestyle changes that can have a big impact on lifespan, even if they're made later in life? I mean, personally, I think that the body is an amazing machine. Um, I started competing in bodybuilding shows. I was an athlete my whole life, a competitive athlete my whole life. But when I started competing in my mid-50s, uh, I'm 66 now, um, I was just seeing all these amazing changes. And I just really think that the body responds really well to good changes or bad changes. That was spot on. Un un until you are in the grave, you can make improvements. You know, dietary changes, exercise. I mean, you can do amazing things with exercise. Interestingly enough, exercise, uh, it has to be a combination of aerobic exercise and resistance, positively affects every tenet of aging, every one. So if you want to do one thing that's good for you, go exercise for an hour a day at least. Um, be it walking, whatever you're doing now, I would just recommend like jacking it up a bit. So if you're an absolute couch potato, walking is useful. If you're used to walking, you know, run or bike or swim. Uh, if you go to the gym and you lift itty bitty weights, you know, jack it up a bit. Um, absolutely. There, there is absolutely no reason to not do this stuff as you get older. Right. The only thing I would suggest, however, is I know a lot of people that decided to go to the gym and then they do a lot of heavy squatting with those big, you know, 
I don't know. Yeah, I'm not a weightlifter, so you would know. But the big weights on their back, and they pop their discs, and then you know they're sort of screwed. So the answer is, I would not recommend putting monster weights on your back as you get older. Right. There are other ways to develop muscle mass. Right. And I I just got a DEXA scan back in December, and I just I got back really great results. And I think it's just from you know lifting weights. And I've actually had a couple of pretty good falls over the last couple of years in Europe on the cobblestone street. And, you know, never broke anything. So I'm just, I attribute that to weightlifting. I think a lot oh, yeah. of people, especially my age and older, you know, I re- read studies where people, it's like 60% of people over the age of 60 die after a fall. And it's not from the fall itself. It's just from complications due to the fall. Oh, with, without a doubt, you're spot on. Um, and compressive force on bones causes it to get stronger. So you know, that's fantastic. I mean, obviously you're in amazing shape, but it's, but it's true. So from an anesthesia point of view, we see this in the OR all the time, you know, an older lady trips and falls. She's osteoporotic. She gets a hip fracture. She's in the hospital. She gets a pin. She gets a clot, it goes to her lungs and she dies of a PE. Mm-hmm. That's the standard mode of death. So anything you can do to, you know, prevent that is, is, is useful. No, I, I agree. Um, I'm going to switch over maybe to some skin care. Um, what are some of the most common skin care concerns for women over 50 and how can we rectify those through supplementation or some like biohacking uh, tricks that you might have up your sleeve? <laughs> um, so, so number one, your skin has cells just like your cells everywhere in your body. So I would argue that your skin is a reflection of what's inside of you, but you don't, you want to treat the skin same as you treat your insides, right? So same seven tenants apply. They're just kind of worse because you've got the elements coming at you, right? So um, I take things orally as well as topically to fight this off. So one of the huge problems with skin is free radicals. Sun, uh, specifically like UVA and UVB radiation, hit your skin and it actually melts your DNA together. Mm. Um, it's this thing called cyclobutane dimers, CPDs. Um, and what's cool is there's an agent called astaxanthin, comes from algae, completely natural, and it actually goes, you know, goes all over your body, but in your skin specifically, it kind of prevents the free radical damage. So it prevents the CPD formation. Thus, it saves your skin and prevents skin cancer. So I think that that's just amazing. Um, In terms of what happens as we get older, lots of unfortunate things happen. If you look at a cross section of skin, the top is the epidermis. And then there's this layer of uh, sort of vacillates, looks like egg crate in three dimension. That's your dermal epidermal junction. And when you're young, it's huge troughs and valleys, and it creates a huge surface area so that nutrients can go from your dermis into your epidermis and keep it looking nice and healthy. As you get older, it sort of flattens out, surface area is lower, therefore it's extremely hard to get stuff into your epidermis. Your epidermis just looks like garbage because it's not hydrated and it's not getting nutrients. So how do we fix this? It's an excellent question. You have to be more aggressive about getting things into your dermis to come up, and you have to be more aggressive about putting stuff on your epidermis to come down. Um, So if you look at my bathroom, it looks like a cosmetic place just sort of vomited. I have everything (laughs) known to mankind, and I I rotate them all. Um, And I know women have been on the same skincare routine or the same company, whatever, for 20 years. And, And my argument is always... We know that broccoli is good for you, but if you ate broccoli and broccoli only every day, after about a year, you would be nutrient deficient, right? So my general recommendation is pick varieties of things and rotate them. And remember, you've got AGEs to deal with. You've got sirtuins to deal with. You've got nicotinamide issues. You've got every issue on the inside is on the outside. The good news is you can attack it from both. So all the stuff that you take on the inside will go to your dermis and it'll exude out into your epidermis. And you can put the same stuff as long as it's transdermal penetration, the outside, and then it sort of penetrates in. So if you can aggressively get this thing, you can save your skin. That's a great, great advice. Great advice. Are there any like skincare treatments that you're particularly a fond of? Oh God, well, I do everything known to mankind. Um, I've been lasering my face every two months for 20 years. I love, 
mean, it's, it, it's kind of absurd. I have a laser man. I don't even choose what he does. Everyone always asks, what do you do? And the answer is, I have no blooming idea anymore. I sit there and he just fries me. And you look like you've got leprosy for about a week and then it falls off. And everyone goes, oh my God, you've got great skin. Right. Um, so I think that that's kind of a good idea. Um, I think that a heck of a lot of moisturizing. Um, what that's else great. do I do? Is, is that big on your list? Oh, man, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. Um, I love red light therapy. I have this big panel that I sit in front of. I try to do it every day until I forget. Extremely good for your skin. Uh, red light and infrared light therapy actually increases the rate of energy production in mitochondria. So it'll give your, your, give your face or like a fresh thing to do or a fresh, fresh look because you've got more energy. Um, I inject exosomes into my face every month, and that's kind of a crazy thing to do, but it's been extraordinarily beneficial. Uh, if you can't afford exosomes or you don't have access, PRP in the face is unbelievable. Um, I have little PRP clubs for ladies that want to do that. Um, clearly, I'm a big fan of Botox since I can't move my forehead. Um, <laughs> not that it actually helps you not age, but it just you know sort of gets rid of wrinkles, and I call it spackle because it just makes you look better without actually being better. Right. Right. Um, I have a juve, which is an infrared. Um, it's like a little panel. It's, it's, you know, probably, you know, two feet. And I, yeah, I, I, we, we must have the same panel. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I can stick it on the counter and, you know, and, uh, and use it. And then with me traveling, I have an infrared, um, a, it's like a heating pad, but it's an infrared that I nice. can, I can take with me on my trips. So like right now I'm dealing with a partially torn rotator cuff. And uh, every day, um, if I'm at work at night before I go to bed, I've got my little, you know, heating pad on my little infrared, you know, on my shoulder for like a half an hour or so. So, um, but yeah. So, so I so I can tell you that you only need to use it for nine minutes. Nine. Okay. In fact, what's really interesting is there's a it's a it's a it's a curve. So that if you use it up to nine minutes, it's helpful, and if you use it beyond that, it's, it's actually detrimental. Oh. <laughs> okay. So, so half an hour is maybe a little bit much. So okay. maybe maybe at nine minutes, move it to a different area of your body. Okay. And then the effect lasts for about six to eight hours. So if you want to do it twice, uh, th that helps a lot. I like that. Thank you for that recommendation. I'll definitely take that into consideration. Um, what do you think some of the common skin skincare mistakes that women over 50 um, make and should avoid? Oh, God. So... I've had so many people come to me and they want me to put filler in these creases. And I, they all think that that's going to make that better. And number one, I'm not a huge fan of filler. I usually use like mesodermal therapies or some other, some other things. Um, but what I tell people is if you put um, PRP, exosomes, sort of uh, the, the stuff that improves the skin underneath, it'll lift your face up instead of pulling it down because you see these ladies and they, you put it here and it's, it's, they just look like dysmorphic monkeys. Um, and, and they look at me like I'm crazy. And then they look at their friends and they go, Oh shit, they do look a little bit like dysmorphic monkeys. So do not do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, other mistakes. Let's see. I think the, these women carrying around giant jugs of water are absolutely obscene. I mean, in reality, uh, people drink 17 gallons of water a day. All they're going to do is pee it out. Um, but the idea is that you you drink the water, it goes to your tissues and you look nice and plump and hydrated. In reality, when you get older, your skin is lacking in hyaluronic acid. Um, so the water goes in, it has nothing to stick to because water sticks to hyaluronic acid. So you just pee it out and it, you're just not doing any good. But if you take oral hyaluronic acid, it actually goes to your fibroblast, stimulates the, pro the, the production of more hyaluronic acid. And then when you do drink the water, it sticks. Uh, and then you look nice and plump and hydrated. Um, and you don't have to drink as much and look like a crazy person with that giant thing of water. So hyaluronic acid will absolutely make that not necessary. That's great. That, that, that's great. Any um, natural or DIY skincare that you maybe do at home? Yeah. So I create a lot of my own products. Um, I create this fantastic. I, it's it's I, my kids started calling it shower goo, uh, which doesn't sound very good, but it's kind of what it is. So I take a variety of butters. So it's shea butter, cocoa butter, mango butter, green tea butter, and um, lemon peel butter. 
and and then I melt it all together and I throw in some uh, metacurcumin, some tetrahydrocurcumin and some astaxanthin. And you get this weird looking yellowy goo, right? But if you put it on ice and whip it up, it turns into this amazingly cool, it's like fluffy butter. Um, and when I'm in the shower, I slather it on, um, don't rinse it off. It's, it's, it's not water or, um, uh, it's, it's, it's not gonna be soap. Well, I guess it's soap soluble. It's not water soluble. So if you leave it on, turn off the water, you dry for a second and you are so moisturized. It's astounding. And do, do you wash it off after or no, you, you leave oh, it God, on? No, no oh. absolutely not. Just leave it on. Okay. Just, just leave it on. Leave it on. Right. My computer is dying. So I have to do the whole plug thing. Sorry. Okay. There we go. All good. Okay, let's see. Um, um, any lifestyle factors that can impact the health and appearance of skin for women over 50? Lower that stress level. Stay out of the sun. Don't drink alcohol. How about that? <laughs> that's that's really... I mean, it's, it's, it's not rocket science, right? It's, right. It's, it's everything that we already know. Right, right. So let's talk about your books. You've written two. Um, and what makes your books different than the like any other anti-aging uh, books? I'm guessing because it's literally from a, a cellular standpoint. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's, it's people like, oh, is it about yoga? No, 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 no. Um, my books, absolutely. So the first one is called Why We Age and How to Stop It. And the first half goes specifically through the seven tenets of aging. And I try to do it with enough science that people understand it, but not enough that they're overwhelmed. So if you are a reasonably intelligent person, you can get through this. Um, the other thing is that I tend to be a little snarky and it has a whole lot of really bad jokes in it. So if you're <laughs> struggling, 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 just they will be a bad joke and you'll be like, oh, that's kind of funny. And then you'll keep going and it sort of keeps the reading interesting. Um, I was at uh, a booth at a conference, I don't know, a few years ago. And then I had two men in front of me screaming at each other because one thought the jokes were appropriate and one thought that they were horribly inappropriate. Like, how dare I put jokes in a science book? Um, but the fact that they were yelling about this means that they'd both read it and thought otherwise it was pretty decent. Right. Uh, that's the first half of the book. The second half goes over the first, uh, or the top 15 agents that were sort of available um, when I wrote the book. Um, and it explains exactly what, what they do, why they're important, what dose to take, what are the considerations? Um, again, snarky comments as, as you sort of go through. Um, so that, that was the basis of, of all of this. And the idea was, okay, let's cover as many aspects of longevity as possible with the, you know, lo lowest hanging fruit. Um, and then, you know, a few years pass and longevity is taking off and there's so many more agents on the market and what the hell do they do? And we have more scientific discoveries going on all the time. So what I did, the second book is the next 28 agents, exactly what they do. And as I would bring one up, I would say, ah, oh, this is important because it introduces a new principle of cellular aging. You know, maybe it's the mitochondrial uh, permeability transport pore, or maybe it's DNA protection or this or that or the other. So I try to incorporate new science with new agents to try to keep everyone sort of up to speed and going in the right direction. Right. Um, and the caveat, of course, is you don't need to take all of the agents, just the things that sort of are resonant with you or address your medical issues. Um, right. I, of course, take all of them, but I'm, I'm a bit of, of a weirdo. <laughs> And let's see, um, what, um, any specifics for women over 50 about as far as like must haves or must do's and as far as supplementation is concerned? Oh God, yes. Oh yeah. So actually anyone, I'm going to back it up. Anyone over 40 needs the panacea. Okay. Straight up. Uh, and it's called the panacea only because the letters sort of spell it, which is why it's easy to remember. So it's pterostilbene. Uh, which comes from blueberries, and you have to eat five gallons of blueberries. So, ladies, you just can't get away with blueberries. Um, Pterostilbene or resveratrol, uh, but essentially these are the strongest or two-in-one activators, and they're absolutely mandatory. Um, uh, that's the P. PA is astaxanthin. I mentioned that. It's an extremely potent free radical scavenger. Um, I think it should be in the drinking water with fluoride as far as you know the world is concerned because it has no harm, absolutely brings benefits. Uh, the PAN is is uh, NAD precursor. Again, either NR, NMN, 
You can argue about which is better or worse, but I think that they both are rather good. Um, and then there's two Cs, carnosine, which is, which is the uh, dipeptide uh, that I mentioned that comes from meat. Um, it is a transglycosylating agent, so it helps get rid of glucose load. Uh, as well, when you're exercising, you know that burn that you get from the acidosis? Um, it will block that. It is a, it's a muscle buffer, so you can work out longer and harder and then not hurt the next day, and that's sort of beneficial. Uh, and then the last C is curcumin, because it's an amazing anti-inflammatory. Um, regular curcumin is not, um, the bioavailability is terrible, so you need to take one of the ones that are souped up. Um, and there's a million of them on the market. My favorite one is called Metacurcum, and it comes from a company called Rev Genetics because it's in a nanomycel. But there, there's a bunch that are available. You just can't take straight curcumin. Um, so anyone over the age of 40, 45, mandatory, you've got to take the panacea. Um, and then as you get closer to menopause, what you want to do is you absolutely want to focus on things that help with your mitochondria. Um, because mitochondrial failure is one of the big reasons that you go into menopause and then you're miserable because egg cells have more energy requirement than pretty much most other cells in the body, maybe your retina or so. Um, but mitochondrial failure is huge as women get older and makes you feel absolutely like garbage unless you sort of fix the problem. That's awesome. Great advice. Well, I think I've covered everything that I have on my list as far as questions to ask. Um, you've just given us so much information. I mean, you, you probably saw me looking down. I'm like taking notes. <laughs> so uh, this has been great. Um, any, like one last qu question, um, any latest breakthroughs in, in the anti-aging research that you are really excited about? Well, I got to tell you, I'm, ex I'm really excited about, and I don't know if it's a new breakthrough necessarily, but I think it's sort of coming to fruition is, is exosomes. Um, I, 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 I view longevity as protocols as a pyramid, right? I think that there are things that you need to do every day, your supplements, your medications, exercise, diet, light therapies, you know, there's a bunch, you maybe throw peptides in there, depending, whatever. And then there's things that you do have to do every month, right? These are senolytics, um, some IV infusions, perhaps. Um, and this is where exosomes fall into uh, the, the sort of mixture. Um, exosomes from usually fetal tissue stem cells exude these vesicles that are just, you know, filled with up to 250 some um, non-coding microRNAs, a little bit of DNA, cytokinins, growth hormones, and they are extraordinarily regenerative. Um when I first started doing this, I would do it like once a year, then every six months. I finally decided that once a month an infusion of a low dose of an exosome is absolutely pertinent to people as they get older. You feel better, you repair faster, uh, reducing relative risk of, of disease. I think, I think it's an astounding new thing that's finally sort of like coming to the forefront. And where can you get this um, therapy done? Um, some So... The FDA actually says you cannot do it um, IV. It's only approved for topical use only. So if you ask a company that they won't be able to do it for you, but a physician can use it off label. Um, and it's become so popular that uh, my one of my partners and I've developed something called uh, Club Exosome. And we actually host um, gatherings in, in Vegas or uh, a few times a year so that people can actually come and get their exosomes. Mm. Or if people have giant gatherings, we are welcome to be, you know, go there and sort of like help people. Eventually, I think it's going to be a common thing that any physician will do. But right now it's sort of on the forefront. Interesting. Yeah, I'm just three hours from, from Vegas. <laughs> oh, I was there. Well, the funny thing is I, so last week I was in Scottsdale Wednesday through Saturday. And then I was in Vegas Saturday through Sunday. I, I got, I must've injected 40 people. It was, it was crazy. That's great. That's awesome. Um, where can people find your book? Uh, Amazon, pretty okay. much like everything else in life, right? Thank you, Jeff Bezos. Okay. Uh, Amazon uh, is called The Kaufman Protocol, and you'll find both books there or uh, my website, which is kaufmanprotocol.com. Okay. And um, what about a social media presence? If you, people want to reach out to you through social media. I am on Facebook, but I haven't looked at it in a million years because I forgot my password and I'm too lazy to get a new one. So I wouldn't bother there. Uh, I'm on Instagram as Kaufman Anti-Aging. 
Okay, awesome. Well, Dr. Kaufman, it's been amazing having you on the show. Um, we've learned so much, and I definitely am thrilled that you carved out some of your precious time to join us. I know all the ladies over 40, 50, 60, and beyond. I've interviewed, you know, women, you know, 90 years old um, on this uh, podcast um, that were that are athletes, world champions, as a matter of fact, in their in their sport. So wow, um, having someone like you on is also um, very, very uh, important to me because I think a lot of women over the age of 50, you know, all of a sudden they wake up and they don't recognize themselves anymore because they have just either let themselves go or something, you know, physiologically changes or change, uh, changing uh, a mental you know, they're going through different phases of their life as far as empty nesters and body changes, menopause and everything. So um, this has been really informative and really fun. And I hopefully might be seeing you at one of your little um, shows or something when you pop back over to Vegas or something sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to. I think that would be delightful. Yeah. I think you would enjoy exosomes. Yeah, I think so too. So uh, thank you again. And we will um, talk soon. Sounds good. I sure hope you enjoyed this conversation with Dr. Kaufman. So many valuable pieces of great information. I hope everybody was taking notes. And here are some takeaways from our conversation. First and foremost, regardless of your age, Dr. Kaufman says that you can decelerate the aging process. Until you are in your grave, you can make positive changes. Now, as we age, we all become systemically inflamed over time but we can reduce that inflammation th through various longevity protocols. Most cells in our body aren't built to last a lifetime. They're damaged all the time by everything from ultraviolet rays to poor nutrition. When this happens, cells make copies of their chromosomes which contain our DNA, and they divide into healthy new cells. But at some point, these cells lose their ability to replicate. With each cell division, the ends of our chromosomes get a little bit shorter and these regions don't actually hold active genes. They're protective caps called telomeres. Once those telomeres shrink past a certain point, the cells are not able to divide anymore and they enter a state called senescence. Now there's nothing inherently wrong or bad about senescent cells. Senescent cells just behave differently from cells that can still divide. They also secrete a variety of chemicals that activate the immune system. When we're healthy and young, this can help us recover from injury, for example. The issue is when the body doesn't eliminate the senescent cells quickly enough and they make neighboring cells go into senescence as well. That becomes a domino effect that can lead to chronic inflammation. And over time, this makes our brain work slower and causes our body to start to deteriorate. We become more susceptible to disease and we die. But does this really have to happen this way? Well, Dr. Coffin says absolutely not. Now, longevity protocols she recommends should start at age 40. The skin is our largest organ and we literally are what we eat. That's why eating a clean diet is so detrimental, not only to our great overall health, but great skin health too. Now, some of Dr. Kaufman's lifestyle recommendations are keep that stress level low, stay out of the sun, and don't drink alcohol. Use infrared light therapy. Some of her supplementation recommendations are prenatal vitamins, astaxanthin, hyal hyaluronic acid tablets, carnosine, and metacucurmin. And, of course, eating a clean diet and resistance training should always be a part of our daily lives, especially over the age of 50. Now, I hope you took away some great information from this podcast. Please share it with others who would also benefit from, from this. And if you'd be so kind as to go over to iTunes whenever you listen to one of my podcasts, give me a great review. It would be greatly appreciated. Now, if you'd like to reach out to Dr. Kaufman, you can find her at kaufmanprotocol.com. And that's K-A-U-F-M-A-N-N. -N. She's also on Instagram at Kaufman Anti-Aging. You can follow her there. And if you want to check out her books, she has two. They're on Amazon. Her first one is the Kaufman Protocol, Why We Age and How to Stop It. And her second and most recent book, The Kaufman Protocol, Aging Solutions, again, can be found on Amazon. You can find me on Instagram at Helen Fritch underscore IFBB Pro. 
You can reach me out at Helen at ageisirrelevant.com. And you can always go to my website, www.ageisirrelevant.com to check out all my podcasts and all my other fun coaching and fitness information and tips and some free programs. I feature amazing women from all walks of life who range from 40 to 90 on these podcasts who are inspirational, motivational, and transformational in all ways. And I think that if you want to be motivated, check out all the other 96 podcasts that I have done up to this point. Thank you again for joining me. And until next time, age truly is irrelevant. Bye-bye.